Over the years, there are always paradigm shifts, you know? One gets used to a certain type of environment and then there are periods of time where they shift to a very different kind of environment. For example, the 1920s were the exact opposite of the 1930s. So the transition from the 20s to the 30s shocked people. And so you come to periods of time where something has gone on for a long time, such as the easing of monetary policy, but also the quantitative easing. That paradigm, that leveraging up, for example, can't continue. But yet, late in cycles, people extrapolate that which happened in the past, and so there are these surprises. I think there are always these paradigm shifts. And I think by stepping back and seeing history from a longer term perspective is very helpful. I think the Fed made a mistake and I think the Fed understands that it made a mistake in assuming that this is a normal cycle. And what they thought was if you pick up growth and lower unemployment, you're going to produce inflation. We're living in a different world now for various reasons, a world of a lot of excess capacity, a world of digitalization and so on, in which that's not the big thing. The big thing is the fact that we're approaching an end of the power of central banks to stimulate. So the big thing is that we have a very big asymmetric risk. If the economy turns down and we're late in the cycle, so a downturn will come, there is a lack of ability by central banks to be able to be stimulative and to reverse that. And that's happening at a time where there's great wealth polarity. So if the left and the right or the rich and the poor are at each other's throats at this time, and this is when times are good, imagine what it's going to be like when we have a downturn and there's an inability of central banks to respond to that. So that shift in Fed policy, which came at the end of the year, was uh, necessitated by these uh, weakening conditions around the world. I think the key is us staying on top of these changes that we're talking about and responding to them. First of all, I think every portfolio should have the right amount of diversification in it. Gold is an important portfolio diversifier. However, let me be clear, I don't think anyone should have a concentrated portfolio now, okay? So people can hone in on one comment I'm making. I think that the notion of creating a balanced portfolio mm -hmm. is the most important thing that they can do right now because wealth can't so much be destroyed as it can be shifted. And so the world right now largely looks to me leverage long. In other words, there's been a lot of borrowing to buy assets, to buy companies. Companies have borrowed money to buy their equities back and so on. That whole move of leverage long is where the market is. I think there's a vulnerability, what I'm saying is, to that kind of a portfolio and that gold is one of the items that can diversify that. I believe it always should be a certain part of a portfolio because there's a certain environment that it diversifies the portfolio well and a certain environment to worry about. I also think that that environment is riskier, more likely recently now. And that environment is one in which it becomes very difficult to stimulate the economy. And there's a desire to depreciate the value of currencies. Now think about a bond is really the currency. So when one owns a bond or one owns a debt instrument, one is paid a pile of currency over a period of time. When there are a lot of obligations like that, a lot of debt or even unfunded obligations like pension obligations or healthcare obligations that the world has, a lot of obligations, and there's not an effective monetary policy to lower interest rates and stimulate, as we're talking about, there needs to be a, the printing of money, the running larger deficits. We're going to come into an environment, I think, in which there are going to be larger deficits that are increasingly monetized. And in that kind of an environment, the currencies are depreciated. I think that in an evolutionary way, over the next uh, one, two, and three years, that there will be a turn for the worse. Yes, I think that there'll be an environment in which you're going to have excess capacity and debt restructurings and political issues entering into it. I think there's going to be an effect a risk. Well, of course, recessions are always inevitable. The only question is when. And I think that you're seeing this around the world. You could see it through Asia. You could see it in Europe and you can see it in the United States. Let's step back maybe and put the big factors in perspective, I think, and then put a time horizon to that. I think the big factors are 
we are rather late in both the short-term debt cycles and the long-term debt cycles, mm -hmm. meaning the capacity of central banks to produce stimulation. It can be measured by their ability to lower interest mm -hmm. rates significantly and do quantitative easing and have that purchased. We have a problem there, okay? That's a big thing, but it's not an immediate problem. It's a problem that is going to come in the next one or two years. You're seeing it in Europe, you see it in Japan, and to some extent you're seeing it in the United States. In addition, we have the wealth gap. And with that wealth gap, we have the classic political conflict, very much like the 1930s, in which that means that there's greater polarity, greater extremes in both of those. And that will be play a role, because if you change policies, you will have a big effect. For example, when we cut the corporate taxes, mm -hmm. that puts stocks up because after taxes you get more, so you pay more for your stocks. That'll change. So we have this polarity, very much like the 1930s, an inability to stimulate in the same way, and a polarity. In addition, we have China as an emerging country, mm -hmm. challenging the United States as an established country. And that creates a theme, that creates a protectionist type of environment, very much like the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And it also has implications in terms of all sorts of conflict and, frankly, uh, sand in the gears of the efficiency of the economy. Mm -hmm. For example, the supply lines. In other words, we mm -hmm. built an economy in which there was interdependency and efficiency coming from supply lines working in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, as we enter this environment of conflict, there needs to be, for personal security, for the security of the countries, there is a move toward independence. The United States says, I don't want your technologies. And China says, I can't depend on you giving me your technologies. And that changes, that separation changes the nature of the dynamic, which is also an economic influence. Those influences are very similar, as I say, to the late 1930s. They will be dominant. They are evolutionary influences, but they'll play out over the next one, two, three years, I think, in creating a paradigm shift. The world we're going to be in is a very different world than the world we were in. The world we were in started in 2008 yeah. and had to do with central banks printing money and stimulating mm -hmm. and that is reaching its limit and that's why i think we're going to see a paradigm shift so what do you mean by a depression okay something like happened in the 1930s so just to repeat 1929 to 1932 there was a fall in the economy and a very double digit unemployment rates and a magnitude of fall in the economy like about 10 percent do i think we're in that Yes. How was that dealt with? 1933. Um, what they did is they printed a lot of money.